In the name of the living and loving God, who is creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today is sort of like deja vu all over again. I mean, we continue to hear this tragic saga of David, the ups and downs of his leadership, his personal life the pain today of his son being killed for, for strange reasons. And, um, and it just goes on and on. Um, but also that, that reading from Ephesians. I mean, we're reading sequentially through the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, and um, that has sort of a pattern to it. I mean, he's still talking about, the author of Ephesians, still talking about um, the quality of life for those people that he was addressing at Ephesus and um, other places. And John continues, just continues, to talk about the bread of life week after week after week. Happens almost every summer. So sort of deja vu all over again. Haven't we heard this? I mean, how much more do we say about that? But, but, today is different for us. Today is very different for us. As you know, the letter of the, to the Ephesians is written to those people in, in, uh, in, in the western part of, um, I mean, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, but to, to, to churches, to churches where Paul went, probably. But, but we've got another letter. We've got another letter that I want to read today. And it's from our bishops. to be read on this day in all parishes in this diocese. The title is On Charlottesville One Year Later. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as we prepare to remember the events that shocked us and shattered the peace in Charlottesville, Virginia one year ago today, we invite you to join us in prayer and in renewed commitment to stand up to violence, hatred, and prejudice in whatever form they take. On that Sunday, bishops Johnston and Gulick joined over 30 other clergy and lay leaders of the diocese in witness against white supremacy. Along with hundreds of other people of faith, they took their part in countering hatred with the power of God's love. All of your bishops continued that gospel work in a variety of ways in the past year. Now we, your bishops, invite you to continue to stand with us, not just by being present when it is time to make peaceful counter-protest, but by engaging in public discourse, exercising your right to vote, and reaching out to elected officials with the message that God loves everyone, no exceptions. This coming weekend, there will be many events remembering August the 12th, 2017. Please hold in prayer those who will attend, as well as those who are still recovering from the trauma of that day. We invite you to pray the prayer below in worship on Sunday or at any time over this weekend. So will you please stand in prayer, in unity of faith, and, respect, and in respect for those who were killed and injured, either physically or emotionally, one year ago today. Let us pray. God of peace, we remember before you the events that shattered our commonwealth one year ago today, when voices of hatred and division descended upon the town of Charlottesville. We pray for Heather, who was killed, and the two officers who died, and for the dozens who were injured. We pray for those who lost all sense of safety in their own communities, we give thanks for the men and women from a wide range of faith traditions who witness to your love and your truth with their prayers, their songs of hope, and their very bodies as they stood against violence. 
Bless our continued resolve to say no to hatred, violence, and prejudice in whatever forms they take. And give us the courage always to be faithful witnesses to your love, your truth, and your peace. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Yes, today is different, but there's also a connection. There's a very important connection. Ephesians, as I've said, is a letter to those people in Ephesus and in the surrounding churches, sent by an apostle of Paul. And the letter I just read is a letter from bishops. Ephesians is a letter from evangelists. This is a letter from our bishops to this congregation. So, so both are really circular letters addressing a specific context. And the context that the Ephesians letter addressed is one of challenging pagans to a more moral and effective lifestyle. Um, earlier in the, in the letter to the Ephesians, they described those pagans, and of course these were not Jewish Christians, these were Gentile who, Gentile who were becoming Christians, but still were living in the ethos of pagan religion. And in Ephesians 4, 17 to 19, the author says this, Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have ab abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So, so that was the concern. Uh, Paul and his followers were concerned about the way these people were living their lives. They didn't consider it ethical or moral. And so in this letter, in what you just heard, and I'm going to repeat some of it, I, I'm gonna, not going to read it all, but I'm going to repeat some of it that describes the kind of life that, that the author of Ephesians is calling these people to. Putting away all falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members one of uh, members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Don't you? I like that phrase. It's okay to get upset, but don't be sinful about it. Um, do not let the sun go down on your anger. How many couples have um, addressed that issue? You know, if you're mad with your spouse, get it settled before you end the day. Um, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up constructive feedback as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Now, those are some good suggestions. As a matter of fact, all of that has been incorporated into basic ethics and morality of the Western world, and maybe of all of the world. And it's not unique to Christianity. I mean, it's, I mean this is what we tell our children. I remember the comment that popped up lots of times saying, well, she's from a good Christian family, you know, and but the truth is, these are just good moral guidelines for anybody of any religion. And actually, when somebody says he's from a good Christian, grew up in a good Christian home, they're talking about this. They're talking about this. They're not really talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They're talking about behavior. So, good advice. Good advice. But not specifically Christian. However, let me read to you now what I left out. I left out a sentence that said, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. 
What does that sound like? Baptism. See what I mean? Didn't we have a baptism three Sundays ago? I mean, this is just, we're, we're, I guess repetition is a good thing. Baptism, yes. The expectation in the early church when people were baptized is that they would be changed. They, wouldn't, they would act differently. They would be converted spiritually into a new kind of morality. Um, as God in Christ has forgiven you, that's, that's not a part of all kinds of morality. But as, as we know that we have been forgiven by God, think how important that is. Therefore, be imitor, imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here's my point. In that letter to the Ephesians, yes, some great advice about good living comes out of it. But it was all about ethics and morality based on a belief in the risen Christ. I mean, it wasn't just be good to your neighbor. It was about through your belief in the risen Christ, love your neighbor. Do you see the difference? It's very important. It's very important to know where those principles came from, and it's for us Christians. And it's very important to know that for those who were calling others to live in this new way, the rock that they were standing on, that is the message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen. That's the starting point for all of this. So, I wonder, let's go back to that epistle, that Episcopal epistle that came to us from our three bishops. What do we do? What do we do about the challenge that we face in our context? There is an increasing level of malevolent conflict and hatred. There is. What do, we, what do we do about that? And I want to suggest that hearing this reading from Ephesians and even hearing several readings from Ephesians over the past four weeks, it is calling us, that, that piece of scripture is calling us, we're, we're not, is there a pagan in the room? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> there might be, I don't know, is atheist in the room? You know, it's not called, it's not calling us simply to be good people. You know, that's taken for granted. It's calling us to be aware of how our faith in Jesus Christ moves us, inspires us, converts us to be intentional about the way we live our lives and love each other. And there is a difference. It doesn't mean we have to sit down and think about every response we make, but it does mean that in some way, in some way, we remind ourselves about that ethical and moral rock on which we stand, which is the message of Jesus Christ. So what can we do? What can we do? We can live more fully into what our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, has been talking about, the way of love. And so here's another plug for what's going to be happening this September. And we really hope that a lot of people, that everybody here in some way take part in it because that focusing on the bishop's message of the way of love is what these early Christians are talking about. And the context in which Bishop Curry is presenting that as a way for us to become more faithful Christians is the increase in conflict and hatred and lostness in our culture. The point is, what can we do about it? We can intentionally become centered in the love of Jesus Christ. We can live more fully into the words of the author of Ephesians, and we can live more fully into the term 
we pray that the Christ in us sees the Christ in others. How many of you have heard that before? The Christ in me sees the Christ in you. Do you know that term? It's really a very good comment. It's a very good idea because, and it's uh, Henry Nouwen, the author, is uh, the one that sort of started that and actually exists in other forms in other religions. But the point is this. For me to be, the point is this. My heart could be connected to, connected to your hearts and I would respond compassionately in the way I ethically and morally related to you. That's all good. That's all good. But if I'm really aware of how God is within me, Christ is within me, then I'm able to see God, Christ, in you. So it's not just a compassionate relationship, it's a spiritual relationship, which is even better. That's what the author to the Ephesians is talking about. And that's the kind of stuff that we could talk about. These are trying times. It's not an issue of paganism. It's an issue of conflict, hatred, and lostness. And we in Christians can do something about that, first of all, by being even more intentional ourselves and see what seeds that spreads and how that has an effect on the peace, people we meet in our daily lives. May God be with us as we find that Christ within us and that Christ within others. For Jesus has called us to be peacemakers in our time. Amen.